Hi everyone, my name is Nicole Wallace and I'm the program director of the RYR1 Foundation. I would like to thank all of you for watching this video on the role of calcium in RYR1 myopathy. I am joined by a member of the RYR1 Foundation Scientific Advisory Board, Dr. Robert Dirksen. Good afternoon, Dr. Dirksen, and thank you for joining us. Hi, Nicole. Hey, Bob. How are you? I'm doing good. Good to talk with you. Good. Likewise, likewise. So, Dr. Dirksen, would you be able to tell us briefly about your background and how it relates to the study of RYR1 muscle disease? Sure. My training is as a muscle physiologist. I'm interested in how muscle works. Mm -hmm. And during my early training, I was involved in trying to understand how the ryanidine receptor works to control calcium and skeletal muscle, which is a key trigger for um, how muscle contracts and mm -hmm. relaxes. And this was back in the early 90s. And around the same time that I was studying this protein and how it worked, the ryanidine receptor was found to have mutations that caused various diseases. Mm -hmm. One of them was central core disease. So the first mutations in the ryanidine receptor that were found to have uh, disease caused malignant hyperthermia in the early 90s, and then the mid-90s, central core disease, which is a RYR1 myopathy. So around that time, I decided to combine my expertise as a muscle physiologist with this new knowledge that there's a genetic disease related to um, RYR1, and I started to study how those mutations affected the function of the protein. Mm -hmm. Well, awesome. Thanks, Dr. Dirksen. And now, since that we have a better understanding of your background and all of the work that you do, would you be able to explain to us what the role of calcium is in a normal muscle functioning? Basically, how calcium helps the muscle contract and relax, and how a muscle works. Sure. Calcium is the central player in controlling the way muscle functions and mm -hmm. how it contracts and how much force it can generate, whether we walk or whether we pick up an object, um, and how we um, move. Mm -hmm. So um, controlling calcium is very critical for how muscle works. And muscle expends a lot of energy in devising proteins and processes to control how muscle uh, um, controls calcium. Mm -hmm. And the ryanidine receptor is really the central player in this. So normally calcium is in the resting muscle is stored within a compartment inside the cell called mm -hmm. the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Keep a lot of calcium in there. It's stored at very high levels. And the ryanidine receptor is the gatekeeper that kind of keeps it stored in there, uh, away from the muscle myofilaments and allowing the muscle to be uh, relaxed. Mm -hmm. But during a muscle contraction, when we want to generate force or walk or move or breathe, uh, the ryanidine receptor has to be stimulated to open and release this calcium stored in the compartment into the cell cytoplasm, which is where the myofilaments are. It binds calcium, and that causes uh, force generation and the production of force and our ability to do work. And then ultimately, the ryanidine receptor has to close to stop calcium from coming out. Mm -hmm. And there are other proteins that pump the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which then allows the muscle to relax. So you get a contraction and a relaxation of the muscle. And it's really all controlled by the ryanidine receptor. Well, thank you. So now, after we have an understanding of how calcium works in the normal muscle, can you explain to us what is happening to calcium in RYR1 muscle disease? Yeah, so this has been the focus of my work for the last 20 years and actually many other uh, uh, researchers in, in the field. Mm -hmm. um, since that original discovery in the mid-90s that these mutations in the ryanidine receptor result in muscle weakness. And so we had, because we knew the ryanidine receptor was such a key central player in controlling calcium, in the muscle cell and how much we can contract and how much force we can generate. It was obvious to us that these mutations probably disrupted the way in which the protein worked. Right. And so over uh, the subsequent 20 years or so, we've learned a lot. <laughs> to um, say the least. The mutations work by uh, various ways. Um, in some cases, the mutations work such that the Ryana receptor, which is supposed to keep the calcium in the SR, mm -hmm. keep it stored in there, if it becomes leaky, and the calcium kind of leaks out of the store, then there's not as much calcium available to cause a contraction when we need one. Okay. So some of the mutations work by producing this calcium leak and kind of loss of calcium mm -hmm. from that stored compartment. Well, great, Other yeah. Loss, 
Yeah, so that's one class. Yeah. And another class of mutations work in a different way. They actually uh, make the channel not allow calcium to leave the store, mm -hmm. even if it's really full. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the kind of gatekeeper function is uh, too strong, and the calcium is not uh, released through that little hole or that pore as well. And so then if we don't have as much calcium released, the, mm -hmm. there's also not as strong of a contraction. Exactly. And a third class of mutations results in a loss of expression of the ryanidine receptor. So if we don't have enough ryanidine receptor, mm -hmm. then it's not able to do its job. So those are the three general uh, classes of um, how we think these mutations affect that central role of the ryanidine receptor in controlling calcium. Perfect. Well, thank you for that wonderful overview. And I'm sure as you recall, and many of our viewers will remember, at the first ever um, RYR1 Foundation International Family Conference in 2016, you introduced your toilet bowl analogy to our crowd. So for our new viewers and for someone who would like a little refresher, would you now be able to describe that in a little more detail? Sure. Um, I find when I teach, I teach medical students, graduate students, and, and uh, sometimes a visual uh, uh, schematic or, or an everyday right. um, picture kind of um, helps to drive home mm -hmm. some core principles. And so I kind of um, I come up with this idea of the toilet bowl as being <laughs> analogous to excitation contraction coupling or the role of the ryanidine receptor. Mm -hmm. Most of us are familiar with a, a toilet. It has a storage compartment for water, which is the tank, and that's analogous to that intracellular calcium storage compartment uh, called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, or SR, mm -hmm. that holds the calcium, which the analogy here is the water. And the ryanidine receptor shown here is the flapper. That's the little flap, the gatekeeper, that, that normally under resting muscle, the flap is plugging the hole, and the calcium stays in that nice storage tank. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we want to contract, we need the calcium to go into the cell, which is analogous here in the toilet bowl, and we pull open that plug by pulling on the handle, which is called the dihydropyridine receptor, which then opens up the ryanidine receptor to release the calcium or the water from the storage tank into the cytoplasm, which will allow us to have contraction and, and muscle force. So if the ryanidine receptor is not working very well, then this process is not going to be very well controlled. Perfect. And then finally, after for relaxation, the ryanidine receptor closes mm -hmm. and the calcium gets pumped back into the, uh, into the storage compartment. Great. I know that I really appreciate the toilet bowl analogy, so I'm sure many of our viewers do as well. So using that and what you said about calcium, can you briefly de describe to us how this understanding of calcium could have implications for potential future treatments? Yeah, well, that, that's why we're, we try to understand how those mutations affect the ryanidine receptor, because if we can understand what the mechanism by which those mutations work, mm -hmm. then we can start to come up with rational uh, means or drugs or approaches to kind of Great. correct that. Mm -hmm. So... Um, for that one class, the first class of mutations that cause the flapper to be leaky and the calcium to come out of that storage compartment and we don't have enough calcium in the storage compartment, we are looking for drugs or interventions that may stabilize that Ryan receptor to be closed and to not be leaky. Mm -hmm. And so there have been several options. We've looked at um, uh, work from Susan Hamilton and, uh, and Jim Dowling have identified oxidative stress as mm -hmm. being a factor that promotes leak. And so one approach to kind of address that is to use uh, antioxidants like N-acetylcysteine, which mm -hmm. is currently being tested, uh, and whether that can help to um, approve uh, or limit the leak. And also Andy Marks from the foundation is developing um, RICAL drugs that also are right. hopeful to uh, reduce the leak. So right. for those mutations that promote leak, we're trying to stop the leak. Mm -hmm. um, for mutations that maybe affect the expression, we're looking for maybe approaches to kind of uh, increase uh, a ryanidine receptor expression in those individuals. Um, and of course, ultimately, there would be a, it would be nice if there could be a way to edit the mutation out, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a much longer term, uh, exactly. which is kind of being looked at uh, in laboratory uh, scenarios. Well, great. Well, Dr. Dirksen, on behalf of the RYR1 Foundation, 
as well as I'm sure the entire RY1 community, I would like to thank you for not only your time today, but also your continued dedication and effort in bettering the lives of those affected by RY1 myopathy. We really, really appreciate having a key member of the scientific field such as yourself and like you mentioned, Dr. Hamilton, Dr. Dowling, Dr. Marks, all members of our scientific advisory board as well, working every single day to better those lives. So you really are helping transform our motto, strength in numbers, into reality. So we thank you. Thank you, Nicole, and for everything that our Wire One Foundation is doing for the field and for um, you know the patients and families. Uh, it's a tremendous organization, and it's really an honor to be a part of, of your, your group. Well, thank you for those kind words. I mean, we would not be able to be where we are today or where we hope to be in the future without you. So we thank you. Great. Awesome. I really enjoyed talking with you today, Nicole. Yeah, thanks so much, Dr. Dirksen. All right, bye-bye.